Fáilte Roy, welcome to the Lock In Podcast, episode 17. My name is Conor Mwinichon. I work for Black Knight. We're the web hosting company. And later on, I'm going to tell you about a series of free webinars we're running for business. But first, let's talk to our guest. He's a broadcaster, a DJ, a culture vulture, and a genuinely curious and interesting guy. I've known him virtually for... Almost 15 years, but we've only met a handful of times. And isn't it funny that that doesn't sound weird anymore? Because that's the world we live in now. These days you can hear him every day on RTE Gold and at weekends presenting the book show on RTE Radio 1. Rick O'Shea, welcome to the Lock In Podcast. No, Con, it's not weird at all, is it? This is it. This has been the new normal for quite some time for some of us. This is just, I think everybody else is playing catch up, I think. It's really strange. And, and people who, who weren't online and who weren't engaged with social media even or, or so many of these other aspects of, of uh, digital life are now suddenly experts. Well, you know, we're all, some of us are still clamouring to find our way through this, mm. as you've seen yourself in terms of stuff that I've been doing over, over the last while. I think it's, you know, I think over the course of the last few months, I think there have been people your way who maybe would not have engaged mm. with the world online as much as they would have prior to that. And they found that there's a lot of, you know, good stuff here and a lot mm. of dodgy stuff, but a lot of stuff that's well worth paying on to. And it's given, it's given people an immense sense of uh, connection. Uh, and as that's, well. that's and, you know, the likes of you and I doing all this talking yeah. nonsense is probably part of that. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk to you about your, your new podcast in a moment. But first of all, let's, can I ask you, how has the lockdown been, been for you professionally and personally? Um, I know some people have been broadcasting from home at different uh, uh, stages. You're on the radio, I think, six days a week uh, most of the time, Rick. Uh, have you broadcast from home or do you go into the studio? What do you do? I am that one lone soldier who has been in RTE every day since this began. So I I, I wasn't asked hmm. and I thought, fair enough, because there's quite a lot of it going on elsewhere um, within RTE, particularly with my, my old friends in, in 2FM. They've had quite a lot of their programming coming from home, particularly in the early stages. Hmm. Um, radio One has been slightly different in that almost everything in Radio One um, has come from the radio building. Um, and so we kind of fell somewhere in the middle in gold and mm. off I went. Uh, we went into work uh, every day throughout the course of this, myself and Michael and Keith, who've been doing the, the, the daytime shows. Well, Lee's mm. in Limerick, so he's been going to the Limerick studios every day. Um, and, you know, initially it was strange because, uh, uh, you know, RTE is a busy place. So you come into RTE on a regular weekday prior to all of this and it's full of people. There might be an episode of Fair City being filmed. There might be extras who are in there. Are people who are coming in as guests to visit other people. Um, so you have radio working, you have TV working. It's a large complex. The canteen is always a good way to, to, to judge this. So the canteen is smack bang in front of where the brand new gate is that was built, built a few months back. Mm-hmm. You walk straight in and it's there. I have gone into the canteen pretty much every day that I've been in work, which is almost six days a week since March. And I'm the only person there looking for coffee. In fact, I'm the only person there other than the lady who is serving coffee. So it gives you an idea of, you know, you look at what RT has been putting out over Mm. over this time and you listen to the radio output. Mm. None of that has changed. And in fact, in some cases, we've been doing things we wouldn't normally be doing. Just now, like with everybody else, Mm. all of it is happening from remote locations. And as a result of which, for the first couple of weeks, it was very 28 days later uh, in in the radio campus. You you know, I'd go in for an entire week and pretty much not see a single other person in the radio building coming in and going out. They were there, they were in studios, they were doing this stuff, but everybody was staying away from everyone else. Mm -hmm. And in particular, upstairs in the main production office where you would find everybody normally, Mm -hmm. there was no one there. It's extraordinary, uh, really. And yes, as you say, uh, production and uh, broadcasting, and I think the media in general has been doing a, an excellent job of keeping people in touch. Um, the, the book show, Rick, is, is uh, that's finished up for the summer now, has it? Or... Yeah, we, we, we had the strange thing about the book show in that it, you know, it usually happens in two parts during the year. Mm. So there's a section that happens in the, in the spring into early summer, and then there's one that happens in the autumn into, into early winter up, mm. up towards Christmas. This time around, the first section of it was due to happen just as lockdown began. So um, it's done through an independent production company um, uh, run by John Daly, who you you may know used to have a chat show on BBC Northern Ireland, used to produce Noel's House Party back in the day, many moons ago. And he does a lot of independent production work these days, Mm -hmm. including a few bits and pieces for RT. So John is is the producer. John lives in Belfast. Um, 
And as well as that, Owen Sweeney is our other producer on the show and Owen lives in, in Dublin. So we had to virtually meet at the beginning of this and go, can we do this? Mm. Can we put together what we think is a program that will be worth doing from the technical constraints that we had in terms of not being able to get people into studios for interviews, not being able to go and interview anybody wherever they were? Because we produced, there were only six episodes in, in, in this section, but they were all produced in the very, very tight section um, of lockdown. Mm. So... Um, we decided, feck it, we give it a go. Uh, what's the worst thing that can happen? And luckily, the worst thing didn't happen because we found that authors were uh, at home, authors were available. The technology that we were using, um, RTE uses um, tie line technology, which means that essentially we can conduct interviews mm. through people's smartphones that send as good as ISDN quality or better. And as a result of which, we got very lucky and we found a load of people who we wanted to talk to. Um, we did the interviews with them. Owen edited them all remotely. I, I met Owen about maybe three, four times. Um, the, the, the two of us in, in the RTE campus, literally like like spies in the Cold War era, mm. sitting on opposite sides of you know two benches, passing documents between us. Mm. Um, and it, it, it did, and we worked out. And, and, and ultimately, at the, at, the, at the end of it, I think we managed to put together a program that sounds pretty much the same as it would have uh, in any other time. That's that's the interesting thing and it's interesting you mentioned the technology as well Rick um, but of course putting a radio programme together and, and uh, talking to people over tie lines and remote connections is one thing um, but physical events is something different as well you're involved with the, the Dawkey Book Festival is that right and I understand that obviously you couldn't go through with the festival as normal so you guys decided to do something different well, it's a, c- a couple of things happened over the course of this year, and you're right. Mm. Pretty much every physical festival in the country is, is is all gone at the very least until kind of September, October. There are festivals that are attempting to, they're, they're working plans for later in the year that if they can have physical events, they will. Mm. If not, they may move online. Um, very briefly, this all started with the Courage Festival in Galway this year. Um, That's right. We then do a couple of events uh, in Courage. Um, they have a brand new uh, director this year, Sasha Debril, and she had um, she decided very early on that she wasn't going to let everything slide mm. and that wherever possible, she was going to try and put together the whole program uh, virtually. Um, she did. It worked out extraordinarily well. I did a couple of the, the events there myself. The whole thing went out over one weekend. The weekend festival itself would have gone out on. Now, you don't get people in a room. You don't get people paying money at the door. You have to, you know, attempt to, to, to cut your cloth to, to make mm. all of that work. But it did, and it worked, and it created a template then for other festivals across the summer. I was the curator of the UCD festival this year. Now, that was supposed to happen on a single day in June. Uh, across the Belfield campus, it runs mm. throughout all of the uh, the faculties. I had a very small part of that, which was the, the, the literary strand. We were due to do maybe six, seven events, out of which we got five of them, I think, up and running and out, and we ran those virtually. Um, this year as well. Um, my involvement in Docky is, is slightly different in that I'm just one of the judges for the literary uh, prize this year. This is the first year that Docky have done their own um, mm. literary prize. So this was supposed to be year one. There would have been, again, a ceremony. There would have been public interviews. There would have been all of that. And again, I was I was involved in a very, very, very small way mm. um, um, early on in the festival itself. Um, Shan and David, who put the festival together each year, it is very much a physical, real-world festival. Yes. And they had to make a decision as to whether or not all of that would work. And a number of festivals have said, we simply can't make it work without having people all in one place. And from a budgetary standpoint, that doesn't necessarily work as well. Doki would be one of those festivals that would fly in people from the far side of the world. Mm. And if you don't have the budgets to make that work because people physically aren't paying to come and, and buy tickets to come and see the events, then, then it doesn't mm. happen. Thankfully, um, with the uh, with the literary prize, both of those um, still happened. We just had to do our announcements online mm. as we did last uh, last Saturday night, and that was still still fun. But it's it's not the same as being there in the ring. No, and I'm going to to talk to you about that um, impact that that's having on artists and on authors in particular shortly. But um, one aspect, as you pointed out, is that uh, the authors um, that you want to talk to are actually all at home at the moment, uh, for the most part, or indeed have been. Uh, so you decided to. Uh, phone them up or Zoom them up or uh, do a little podcast series with them. Tell me about your your new lockdown-themed podcast. Uh, what inspired it and how's it been going for you? That was a terrible idea. It's the worst idea I've ever had. It's literally, it's a yoke on my neck now at this point. Oh, that's a lie. It's one of the most fun things I've ever done. Um, I, I to, to be honest with you, there's a podcast version of the book show that does the audio version of all mm. these things that, that, that go out. Um, I've never really had an inclination to create uh, a video series, which is what Shelf Analysis Mm. is, until now. 
at the beginning of all of this, all of a sudden when you see, you know, the Late Late Show have their guests on via Skype or via mm-hmm. Zoom or via wherever, and that everybody's watching that and thinking, well, you know, this is the new normal for now. This mm-hmm. is how we're going to get our entertainment. I had that moment of going, you know, if those guys could do it, so can I. And it was at the very, very beginning of lockdown. I was conscious there were a lot of Irish authors who had books that were either coming out or were due to have come out mm-hmm. that then would be bumped off by months. Bookstores were closed everywhere. That doesn't necessarily mean that authors don't need and deserve the great big hoo-ha when their new book comes out. And there were very few outlets to do it. So I looked into the idea of creating, um, you know, a a live chat show. I wanted it to be live as well. I didn't want it to be something that was recorded and heavily edited and put together primarily because that would have been a lot of work. Um, So it either happened live as it was or or it didn't. And again, Courage was part of that because those events all went out live. And there was an element of of interaction both Mm -hmm. on social media and in the chat bars on the side of the YouTube channel. Now, I do mine in uh, in Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is about the interactivity. I run a Facebook. Book, uh, book club that has 32,000 members uh, in it at this point. Uh, and so whenever you run a live event in there, there are a lot of people that are that are willing to, 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 to pay attention. I started off doing it five nights a week. I was a moron. I thought that this was all going to last about four weeks. She will be over and done with. And won't I have done four weeks of a great little chat show? Mm. And it didn't work that way. Mm. So for the first few weeks, I think it kept me sane and going. And there were a bunch of people I really wanted to talk to. Mm. And it was it was very informal, hugely. So if, if people get to see episodes of it, it involves me chatting for a couple of minutes about things that have gone on in the book world. And then I'm talking to whoever in their house. Now, whether they've got the kids running around, mm. whether they've got a glass of wine in their hands, they, it all happens at kind of seven o'clock in the evening. Um, everything from that to, you know, getting to see what Graham Norton's house looks like and doing one of the episodes is is with him. Mm-hmm. Some of them were done in the States. So some of them are with authors who are in the US uh, in the early parts of lockdown. So they talk a little bit about what life is like for them, both personally and professionally. And then they just recommend three books they think mm-hmm. people should be should be reading right now. And it started, I, I have had to you know, scale, it down, uh, scale it down to three episodes a week and then two. And now it's down to one. But it's down to one because I'm enjoying it so much. I don't want to let go of it. Mm-hmm. So it's now down to one. But I feel like this is going to run on and on and on through the summer and maybe into the into the autumn as well. And I keep getting yeses from people that I really want to interview. So as long as people keep saying yes, yes. I think that's as long as, as the show is going to survive. And it will. Like I got a yes from the one that goes out tomorrow night, uh, which is Wednesday, is John Irving. John Irving's been one of the world's most best known writers since before I was born. Mm. And I got a yes from him. And he's in his apartment in Toronto. Uh, we had to pre-record it because of the time difference and because of his working day. And he's he's talking about how he hasn't left his house since the 14th of March. And he's in his apartment in, in Toronto looking over the city. And just, I felt like these were opportunities that I wouldn't get otherwise. And I think I've been right about that. Now, that will probably change as the world changes and everybody starts to loosen up again and things go back into the real world. But I think I think that for as long as, very long answer to a short question, Con, yeah. I think that for no. as long as um, festivals certainly aren't physically happening, mm. I think there are opportunities to be had with, with things like this. It's quite extraordinary, really. And and uh, it's, it's um, I mean, it's not people aren't necessarily celebrities just because they're celebrities. People uh, that we often revere and admire are celebrities because of their talent or their achievements or whatever it might be. But there is an extraordinary sense of us all being in it together, as you say, looking into each other's living rooms. Uh, I, in particular, have been enjoying uh, musicians and uh, some of the sessions and gigs and things like that that they've been sharing from their living rooms as well uh, in really what are quite, quite unique times. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear it's As you said, it started off as a sprint uh, 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 Rick, I'm glad to, to hear yeah, that no, uh, I, you've got it down to a, a marathon or a more sustainable pace. And uh, as you say, well, there's I, interest I from... So. Pardon? No, I kind of yeah. hope so. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're right, though, in terms of what you say there as well. I think one of the, the major you know, forces about creative people in every yeah. field, whether it's visual art or whether it's music or whether it's writing, is that they are creative. Yes. So when they feel like they're, they're locked up or locked down like this, they feel like they've got to do something because yeah. that's part of their DNA and part of who they are. And that's why you see so many musicians, so many uh, artists um, doing things mm. online now, simply because it's that's that's who they are. There's so much we can't do, Rick. We can't go to gigs. We can't go to concerts. We can't go to uh, book festivals or readings or book signings or things like that. Um, that's a problem. Uh, and yet these artists are, are, we have their recordings, we have their writings, we have their books to sustain us. On the other hand, 
it's uh, it's difficult for I think a lot of the artists at the moment, Rick, because a lot of them rely while they may have produced media for us to enjoy uh, at home. Um, a lot of them rely on the gig economy to one extent or another. A lot of people I know are musicians and and are uh, have seen their income stream dry up in that way. And it's similar as well for a lot of uh, writers who either supplement their income or for whom book tours and things like that and lecture tours are an important part of that. What have you been hearing from the creative people yourself and how are they coping with this? Yeah, I mean, a huge amount of this is is both conversations that, are, that I've had with people offline mm-hmm. and seeing what people are talking about online as well. You're right. There, there are a number of different groups involved here. I mean, the ones that maybe that I'm, I'm part of their world. You're right. With musicians, unless you're the Rolling Stones, you mm-hmm. know, you, you have to rely on gigging yes. to make enough money to keep the bills being paid and keep the wheels rolling on whatever it is you're doing. And because that isn't happening now and won't be happening for the foreseeable future, there are a lot of musicians, Irish musicians and musicians elsewhere in the world who are who are in extreme situations mm. um, right now. That's not going to change and it's not going to get any easier for them until going out and physically being able to gig becomes yeah. a thing. With writers, again, you, 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 know, you might think that, you know, unless you're Stephen King pretty yes. much, if you're any Irish writer, you need to go out and you need to do festivals every year, mostly, you know, to get out there, to meet people, to get them to buy books, to find those books. And, you know, you make a certain amount of money from going and doing those festivals. Mm-hmm. That won't pay the bills. But it, and if you do enough of them across the course of the year, um, that does help. And the other one that maybe people are focusing on as well, and I see so much of over the last few days, is theatre, is live theatre. Um both for the people who are actors and mm. for those who are creatives, those people who write, those people who work in theatres, um, that's not going to be changing at any point soon either. And whilst I've seen some of the most amazing theatre I've seen in a long time, that, that has been put out online. Both you have the likes of everything from the, the, the National Theatre in London is rerunning some of their older ones and they're putting them up on YouTube once a week to uh, even Irish theatrical productions, two-handers that have been happening mm. and happening live and online as well as a, as a as an income stream, that's not going to change anytime soon. You will see potentially theatres closing. And once those places go, they're never going to open again. Theatre companies will go bust. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is a key moment for conversations to be had when you're talking about getting um, the economy up and running that's an important part of not necessarily just the physical economy, but of our, you know, our, our entertainment economy and our well-being economy and those things that we turn to when things like this go wrong. We lean on songwriting and books and mm-hmm. creativity and, you know, they need to be kept afloat now until we can get back to some sort of sense of normality. How are things for you personally, Rick? Um, how is uh, family life and home life and things like that? How are you adapting to the current situation? Of course, things are opening up now. They, they are. And insofar as I'm, I'm starting to feel like things are a bit weird now. Mm. So, OK, every day that I've been, been going to work, I've been getting up, leaving my house, driving into RTE mm. and going to work in an abandoned building <laughs> to all intents and purposes and then driving back through the empty city and, and coming mm. home. Now, my wife um, works, but she's been working at home as well since all of this began. Mm. Um, So she initially had herself set up in the kitchen inside with two screens in front of her Mm. and boxes of files and and, and all of that. Now, since she's moved uh, upstairs to the the spare bedroom because she was like, I just need to be able to walk down, get a cup of coffee and then walk back up to my Mm. office. So she and that's going to be for her. That's going to be that way for the the Mm. foreseeable future um, as well. I don't know. And again, it's another conversation I don't think people are maybe having is mentally. I think I've spoken to a lot of people, to friends, to people mm-hmm. online who who haven't done so well throughout this. And it's not necessarily because they've lost their jobs or it's not because they've, they've been through uh, tough circumstances or it's not potentially because they've had friends or family who've been ill. It's that this is an extraordinary situation for all of us. None of us has ever been through this last three months mm-hmm. and hopefully none of us ever will be again. But it does take its toll on your mental health and on your mental well-being, the, uh, the being taken away from other people around you, your ability to socialise with friends and family, um, and even just sometimes staring at the same four walls every day. Even if you manage to get out, I've been thrilled to have been able to get out and literally go to a darkened studio in a basement for three hours a day and then drive back home again because that's been thrilling. Mm. Um, so I think while it's great that everything is, is, is opening up, I think you will have a lot of people as well who will feel you know, anxious yes. and will feel anxiety about this, that, you know, what if this happens again? So I think for, for a lot of people and myself included, it's been a strange one. And I think that we've probably worked 
all the way through this and thrown ourselves into things that we might not necessarily um, otherwise have done creating, you know, your own video chat yeah. show thing. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, the best piece of advice I got from anybody throughout this entire thing was an interview I did with Anne Enright at the very beginning of this record. And I was asking her about um, what she was doing to get through this. And she said, I'm just cutting everybody a bit of slack. Yeah. And it's gone a really long way. Cutting people a lot more slack than usual for mm. me has gotten me through, I think, a huge amount of what we've been through over the last last few months. Yeah, that's very, very good advice indeed. Um, Rick, thanks a million for talking to us. Uh, continued success uh, with uh, Shelf Analysis, which is the new podcast that you're doing. Uh, where can people find out about it? Yeah, if they want to find it, just go into YouTube, stick in Shelf Analysis. There's 30 odd episodes of it there, uh, as is. Uh, you'll find them all there. You can look back through all the ones that we've done right back to the very beginning when everybody was still in panic mode. So they're, they're still well worth it. The new episodes go out in the Ricochet Book Club uh, on Facebook at seven o'clock on Wednesday nights. But then the following day, they're archived there as well. And you'll find them all on RT Culture. Thanks very much, uh, Rick, and best of luck to you. Pleasure, my, my friend. Anytime. See Thanks you later. A That's our guest on today's uh, podcast, Rick O'Shea from RTE. Uh, now, just when we're talking about arts and artists uh, and theatre and drama in particular, you may recall back in episode nine that we interviewed Sean Branagh, who uh, was the writer and director of a horror short film which uh, he produced and directed and shot uh, with the help of some actors, obviously, and all presented in that little virtual cyber window uh, that we find ourselves looking into so much uh, of the time nowadays as well. Now there's a follow-up to that. That film, of course, is called Forever, if you want to look it up or go and uh, check out episode nine of this podcast at uh, thelockin.ie. The uh, follow-up, not related, it's just uh, in a similar vein, I suppose you could say. It's actually produced uh, by one of the stars of that film, who wrote and directed it. That's Irene Keller. And uh, she's got a great ensemble cast together and it tells the story of the AGM of the Ballyluckley Drama Group, which, of course, in current circumstances has to take place virtually. It's called Lockdown AGM and we'll post a link to that uh, in the uh, podcast as well. You can see it on the screen if you're looking at the video version on YouTube. I also want to mention this website in particular. It's a site called reopen.europa.e. EU. Uh, that tells you it's an official EU site, but it tells you information as Europe reopens, which countries you can travel to, what kind of uh, regime or what kind of uh, restrictions are or are not in place in the different countries. And it may be of interest to people who need to travel for or wish to travel for uh, work or pleasure or one reason or another. And also, as I mentioned, I just want to mention the brief series of uh, free business recovery webinars that we're running here in Black Knight. Black Knight is uh, Ireland's largest web hosting company. I work for Black Black Knight and the programme is brought to you by Black Knight. As you might imagine, we've been very busy these last few months. But to be honest, it's not simply a case of simply uh, saying, here's our products and services, off you go. Many of the people who are coming to us now are businesses who have realised that in order to survive, even in a reopened, socially distanced uh, sense, they need to have uh, some technology on their sides, whether it's a, a click and collect service or some kind of a booking or appointments service that they choose to use. The technology is there, but what we found is that uh, people don't just need the technology and the tools, they also need advice as well. And we found that our staff here at Black Knight are very busy answering people's questions and teaching and learning and things like that as well. So we've launched a series of uh, free webinars. They're available uh, to anyone if you just go to bk.ie slash webinar. And the theme is Bricks and Clicks. It's all about blended business. So uh, you're in a normal shop or store or restaurant or barbershop or whatever it is, but you can also use some kind of technology to help you manage things and make sure that both you, your staff and your customers are all kept safe as well. bk.ie slash webinar. The first one starts tomorrow, the uh, 24th of uh, June, Wednesday, 24th of June at 2.30pm. But don't worry if you miss it. Once you've signed up for all five webinars, uh, we'll send you the links to the recordings of each one of those. Marcin Sinovildan Trosa, thanks uh, for being with us today. More information at thelockin.ie and we'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Slongafol.